everybody, and welcome to the Disruptive Diner. I'm at a, at a musical sting. That's cool. Uh, I'm Dan Roos. It's, I'm founder and chief instigator of Openly Disruptive. Uh, today is September 17th, 2013, and I say that because we're actually recording this. So thank you for joining us today here at Lab 1500, and for those of you joining us online. Um, what we're going to talk about today is profitably sustainable food. So um, regardless of where you fall on, on the world in the world of organic versus commercial or factory farming and traditional and all kinds of different spectrums, you have to realize that the food needs of our population across the world are actually growing faster than our ability to serve them. Um, and, um, and we're finding all kinds of alternative uses for all those calories we produce in the field, you know, biofuels and all kinds of other things. So we need to address food. At the same time, we're starting to realize the health implications of how we've scaled up food before. And finally, we're starting to realize um, the economic implications of the communities that we're in. So food is actually an area that's ripe, uh, no pun intended, for uh, disruption. There's some real opportunity to do some things differently here. And whether you're Monsanto or the organic hermit, that um, wants to uh, stay off the grid, you've got to realize that there's a problem, and that problem equals opportunity to, to work together. So today we're going to talk about that from three different perspectives. Same way. Who you're going to see today are Mark Bowers, who's standing right here. He's going to be first. Uh, Mark is a serial product developer, both in large organizations and also in uh, private equity and even privately held companies. And, and, the and he's going to talk about an opportunity that he's seen to develop some products for a particular niche in this space that we're talking about. So, Mark Bowers, uh, standing here, come on over. Um, Mark is actually a good friend. Thank you, Dan. And um, he and I work together on Product Camp St. Louis, which is, brings together a lot of people that develop products. Um, he may tell you a little bit about his past history with organizations like Colgate, Palmolive, and Toro, and his own private companies. Um, but I'm going to let him tell his story. And remember, you got 20 seconds per slide. So cut okay. him some slack, and uh, we'll ask questions at the end just so that we don't hijack his presentation. Are you ready? I am ready, sir. All right, so let's go ahead and move you. Awesome. OK, so the first thing that I wanted to do is mention to everybody is it means that I sell things. It means that I'm interested in a lot of little niche markets. I'm not an academic, I'm not a specialist. I've broken this presentation up into three sections, and the three sections are nothing more than expressions of what I've learned from the people that I've met. There are a lot of challenges that the local war movement faces, and Global Hug Count is certainly one of them at a very, very macro level. The net takeaway is simply the population has scaled to levels where old methodologies don't work, and things that used to be environmentally friendly and ecologically friendly no longer are. The problem's expected to get worse. In addition to that problem, we have other challenges uh, and more obstacles. Water scarcity, soil scarcity, issues that around phosphorus, the carbon footprint that modern, modern agriculture now consumes are all sort of counterproductive and counterintuitive to the way that we need to live for our own nutrition. Dietary variety as a result, no big surprise, has become an issue. We eat what's commercially viable. The key takeaway from this slide using cereal, global cereal production as an example is that approximately 90% of your production is now consolidated worldwide in three grains, three cereals, corn, rice, and wheat. So what does all of that mean? Uh, there are environmental challenges that exist. They're spilling over into global food production. These challenges have always existed and technology historically has been ahead of the challenges that we've faced. Economic realities are now also factors. We eat what's commercially viable, which isn't necessarily what we were designed to do. As a result, we're very detached from our food system. What can you do about it? The traditional things, the list is, is very, very lengthy. Uh, you can recycle, you can mow your yard less, you can do all of these other things. Alternatively, a lot of times the solutions to problems are the things that are maybe the, the oldest and the most traditional, or the things that are right under our, our noses. Family farming is one of the things that we always dismiss as urbanites and say, you know, gosh, we could never do that. 
realistically, if you were consuming 9,200 calories a day for a family of four, depending on how it was planted, soil quality, and a number of other factors, you would need about an acre and a half to two acres, less if you were meat free and you didn't have crop production dedicated towards uh, animals. Homesteading is a viable option. The key takeaway in this slide is that this guy in Pasadena has 120 or 20% of an acre, one fifth of an acre, half of it grows food. He's got 350 different vegetables, fruits, and berries, and he harvests 6,000 pounds a year. It can be done on a very simple level. There are other options that are coming online and that are creating business opportunities and opportunities for some of these niches to be realized. Green roofs are certainly a solution at some point here in the near future, I would expect to start seeing green roofs as options in new home construction as opposed to retrofits that were done specifically by engineers. Another option or another thing that's, that's really a, a big point right now is uh, keeping all water that falls on site on site through use of rain gardens uh, to reduce the system stress on the stormwater system so that you don't have huge shocks of water trying to run through storm and wastewater systems setting up rain gardens to utilize the water on site for your own food production. Aquaponics is another example. It basically takes the byproducts of aquaculture and the byproducts of hydroponics, mit mates them together in a way that's beneficial for both, effectively pushing you one step closer towards edible landscaping, not just in terms of what's planted, but also in terms of what's used in, uh, decoratively in your, uh, in, your, in your household environment. Foraging is something that uh, is underutilized. Now when somebody forages, they get their own TV show and they're called the wild man and you watch them on cable. 500 years ago, that was called getting a snack. Most people real don't realize that even just using acorns as an example, acorns are edible. All of them are edible. When you talk to really well-educated people, they don't realize that. They see acorns as nothing more than a nuisance that falls on their yard. But the volume of edible mast that falls out of a tree on off of one oak tree alone is enough to really have a significant impact on and, and, civic, uh, and a significant offset to other flowers that you might use. So I did an acorn project a couple of years ago just to see if someone without any formal training could do it. Um, I've got the lessons learned here. If anybody was interested really in the details, you can reach out to me with the email address that's provided. The net takeaway is it is very doable. It's something you can do with your kids and it's something that in a hobbyist level actually helps bring you into a much better understanding of your environment and, and much better interaction with the people that you're working with. The, last, the third and last part of this presentation that I wanted to focus on is a new product idea that I've been tossing around with some people that I've been working with to sort of tie some of these niches and opportunities together in one comprehensive way that gives higher end food production capacity to uh, existing homes. So, Traditional gardens are labor intense, they're very seasonal, you can't move them around once the box is planted. If you have drought or pest infestation, it's in the ground, it's stuck, and that's your season. There are a lot of limitations. It also displaces a lot of space that you can't use for other things like family time, lawns, enjoyment. If you take a lot of the components that we talked about, a water recapture system, a vertical growing wall, solar panels on the roof, maybe even a green roof, you tie them together in a way that the, the household that we gave an example on earlier in Pasadena had done, you can basically use your home and your landscaping to offset a significant amount of your own food production. The advantage is, you know, obviously there's an economic advantage, but the real advantages I see are twofold. Number one, you're taking control over your nutrition, your own personal household nutrition. So you get to choose what to plant. You're not picking one of the same three tomato varieties that are available because they're the easiest to ship to the supermarket. You're also getting an opportunity to have greater control over your own health because there's exercise working the yard and working the land. The target markets for a project like this could really extend anywhere from big box all the way down to architects and specifiers. The point with a product like this or, or with any type of opportunity like this is that what it enables people to do is it enables people that otherwise would sit on the outside of that bullseye of people that are really deeply involved in the organics food market and it pulls them into the bullseye. It makes them a part of the next generation and it makes them a part of the solution. It's good to see a full house here today and beforehand I was talking with one of the gentlemen in the audience, William, and 
one of the things that we had discussed was when you look at that next ring out from the bullseye as we know it today, as soon as one person in the suburbs converts, it's much easier for acceptance to spread throughout a neighborhood. I look forward to anyone that wants to contact me and I thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Um, so remember that we have people that are watching via live stream and that we have a video that we'll do of the discussion. So um, when we ask questions, I just ask that you wait for the microphone so that uh, we can all obviously hear you here in the room. But Mark, Mark, one of the takeaways I have from this is, and we're all, I mean, you're a little bit of preaching to the choir here. It's not yeah. like there's anybody here like, well, I don't know if I want to get into this because I don't know if I care about the planet or my neighborhood or, you know. Um, but. Um, one of the things that you've done is you've really taken a very complex thing and productized it. So somebody can actually understand, oh, this system that I could go buy from somebody is something where I could make a difference. And maybe I don't have the time or the education or whatever else. Um, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, you know, I think another thing, too, is that even if you get the, the system, so to speak, down to the point where you're buying a kit, so that it's no different than any other home improvement that you would make, People out in the suburbs that now wouldn't think twice about remodeling their own closet, wouldn't touch something that grows because there's this sort of fear factor. I don't have enough time to manage it, I'm gonna screw it up, I'm gonna look like an idiot. You take that out of the equation, it's no different than remodeling a closet. So what questions or comments do you guys have here, Steve? Um, I would ask around, uh, first thought I had when I saw that was getting around subdivision rules in regards you can't have a garden. Um, you know, that's an interesting point, and I think a lot of times it's sort of a chicken and the egg question. Do you get around the subdivision rules first, or do you prove to your neighbors that it works so that you have more people that want to get around the subdivision rules with you? Realistically, if you have sweet potatoes growing in your front yard, in the current state of America in the suburbs, nobody's going to know it's not ground cover. That's reality. So, um, you know, a little bit, you know, feeding into that, um, one of the things is going to be having some data to back up that this is actually meaningful, that this is making an impact. And um, Teresa's here, and Teresa's actually an entrepreneur, and she's working on some things to help people understand the impact of what they're doing. And I'm just wondering, you know, he threw up a lot of really interesting numbers. You know, is it possible to provide something that actually helps convince the, the naysayer that this is working? I mean, is it possible to be objective about this? It'd be very interesting because... Um the ideas that I throw around is if we could do, you know, uh, there are programs that when you're filling out a profile, it kind of gives you a pie shape, and the pie keeps filling the more, you, the more detailed you fill it out. Well, my interest is helping farmers in that way to help them see the perspective of what they're doing, the practices they do to help their soil and water conservation. Something similar to what you're doing. You know, if it's a kit idea, it seems like you could have a pie and like, oh, you're doing the, the hanging garden. Ah, okay, that's one. Oh, there's solar panels. Oh, that's another. So it's kind of like this achievement thing to show this is sustainability and you're hitting all the marks, whether you're urban or rural. Thanks. Other questions? Uh, th just a comment on that. You know, I mean, the other, the idea that that gives me is, you know, when I hear you say that, I mean, that's, that's great, but you could take that as well and you could build, build that out with the schools. So that it's now it's something that, you know, by, by default, the neighborhood's trying, you know, all the kids, you know, it's family involvement, it's all the positive elements of any other activity, they're going to have a halo effect on how people regard that as, as, a, as, a, as a home practice or a neighborhood practice. You touched on the, um, the idea or the fact that people have a lot of um, trepidation about tackling or diving into, you know, it's... It's intimidating enough if, you know, for some people to try and grow tomatoes in their backyard, but to go full sale into a system like this, um, what is the kind of support, that, I mean, or do you feel that there needs to be some sort of live support behind that in order to, you know, in order to, to go that extra mile and really convert people? Yeah. yeah. I mean, as business ideas go, these are, are, as a generalization, smaller business ideas. No one's deluding themselves into believing that they're going to find the next Facebook in this space. There are a lot of hobbyists that are out there. There are a lot of various types of solutions that pull different things together. And fortunately, there are also a lot of online meetup opportunities and, and groups. The, the, the challenge, once again, is people say, well, you know, I tried one of those once and it didn't work. Well, you know, you try anything once, it doesn't work. You know, the reality is that it's no diff different than any other project. The most difficult thing that you will ever do is start. 
period. And start doesn't mean go to one meeting and then because you didn't see your best friend, not go to any more. Start means you go to six. Start means you meet up with a number of different groups. Start means that before you leave the meeting, you ask who else you should be meeting in that community. You will eventually build the infrastructure you need within your own neighborhood, just like you would if you were researching anything else. And you'll make some neat friends in the process. And you'll learn a lot as, as, a, as a result. I'm not formally trained. I've not learned anything other than what I've been taught by going to meetups, meeting with friends, and, and reaching out and staying in contact with people. And knowing who to call when I have questions. I just, I think you've got something here. First of all, rain barrels are back in. You know, everybody, you see rain barrels. You got them at Sam's everywhere. The other thing is, why do people go to Lowe's and Home Depot? They like to build stuff, and they like to build stuff in a weekend. Hopefully not more than a Saturday morning. You got all these scout groups going out, wanting to build a little project here and there. You got a simple compartmentalized thing of a vertical growing wall. Go get six parts or whatever. Get yourself a rain barrel. Hook up some tubes, and you're done. And it doesn't, uh, my idea the you're not violating the rules of the subdivision. You turn it into a fence, you can turn it into this, you turn it into that, turn it into a wall. Shade it's, a, it's a piece of structure. And you've bypassed all that stuff. And it's done. And that's why I think it's a good idea. And then they can grow stuff. It's just like the tomato plants hanging from the, you know, the tomato plants that hang upside down from the baskets. The problem is that you don't have the water, all these other things. It, this is even engages more of the engineering, hey, I can put stuff together and link them and you get the rain barrel. And, and that just feeds into what people like to do.